I want you to understand that this is a fight, that this is a war, and it's not just a war against the cultural left. It's those on our side who falsely claim that they're fighting on your behalf, but are simply saying to you what you want to hear and aren't willing to fight for what you believe in. Carrying on the legacy of Andrew Breitbart, this is Breitbart News Daily with your host, Alex Marlowe on Sirius XM Patriot 125. Welcome back to the broadcast, Breitbart News Daily. Mark Levin is on the line with me, host of the Mark Levin Show, which you can hear every evening on the station, Life, Liberty, and Levin on Fox News. Levin TV on Blaze TV. He's also, you pick up his radio show on podcasts. Uh, he's on Twitter at Mark Levin Show, Mark with a K. Uh, Mark, it is great to have you on the broadcast. Also, you're the author of many books. The most recent one is Unfreedom of the Press, which is my favorite of the many books of yours I've read. It's great to have you on. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Alex. So we've got a lot to talk about, but uh, there's been something you've been talking about a lot on your show about what kind of country we want to leave uh, for, what grandparents and parents uh, want to leave for their children and grandchildren. And I, I think this is such an important concept. And on my show, I'm very analytical and I'm breaking down the moment to moment news cycle. But sometimes we lose track of really what's at stake coming up here in two and a half weeks. And some people are voting now, as we all know. Uh, and, and I want to talk about this concept in general, and I got one specific, and then we can get into some of the news of the day. Uh, but speak to us about this broader concept, because this is so important for my audience to think about. Well, you know, every uh, great republic has to make a decision. And um, every republic in the past has made the wrong decision. Athens is gone. Rome is gone. The great British Empire really is gone. Um in our country, relatively speaking, when you look at these these former democracies, as they say, Athens and Rome, they they existed for some time. We haven't been around that long, and um, you can see we're really fighting two wars on two fronts. One is with China; that's the that to me is the uh, existential foreign policy threat, and then the enemy within, which is the name, believe it or not, of a Robert Kennedy book, and it's absolutely true: the enemy within. And it's the enemy within that's going to destroy us. And um, I'm not the first to say this. Jefferson said it. Lincoln said it. Reagan said it. And it can occur in one generation. And that's where we are right now. I think about my grandfather who fought at Iwo Jima in Guam and my great uncle fought at Guadalcanal. And I'm not alone. A lot of your listeners went to war. Uh, a lot of your listeners have family members who went to war. What did they fight for? Did they fight against the Constitution? Did they fight against the Declaration? Were they against individual liberty? Were they against capitalism? No, they they supported all these things, and they wanted the best country possible for their children and grandchildren. This is an election about our children and grandchildren. Are we going to leave them a nation that's free and prosperous? Are we going to leave them a nation that's balkanized and tribalized? with the iron fist of a central government making decisions on who does and doesn't get rights? Are we going to accept the most radical uh, description of this country as systemically racist and white privilege and all the rest of it? Are we going to treat this country the way it ought to be treated? And the people is the most diverse country on the face of the earth with the greatest equality, greatest opportunity, the greatest psychology of any country on the face of the earth. It is shocking that we've reached this point and we've reached it so fast. I don't want people to forget the riots that took place all throughout the summer. I don't want people to forget how silent the media and the Democrat Party were, if not the propagandists for it. Sure. Uh, they, do not, they do not have an attachment to our history, and we have entities like the New York Times that are trying to destroy our history. So this election isn't about health care or taxes or regulations. It's about a whole lot more. It's about, to be honest, it's about a constitutional representative republic. That's your vote. And I say to people, you need to get five or ten people to vote with you. It's not enough to vote. We're not asking anyone to go to war over this. We're not asking anyone to lose their lives over this. Just be your own precinct captain and help us win. 
Uh, I love that, and I've been saying that really for the most of the year, making sure people are registered, and it's not enough just to vote, and it's not enough to be in the silent majority. You have to be much more vocal at this point, Mark, because those really are the stakes. And I, I was struck by something you just said about tribalism, because routinely people like you and I are called uh, saying that we're tribalists. I'm not tribalist in the, in the slightest. It's the left who is. They're yeah. the ones who are just, if you're not in our tribe, you're bad. And you know this because whenever there is a criticism of Breitbart or a criticism of something I'm doing, and the left might be right on it, and I make an adjustment, Mark, they hate me even more. They hate you even more. If you ever learn from yourself and improve what you're doing, they resent that. And they resent it about this president who has done his level best to try to reach across the aisle. And whenever he does, they hate him more that day than the day before. You know, if you really think about it, and of course the left takes everything I say out of context because they don't really want to debate what I say or what we say. Now the left is back into a segregation mode, uh, describing people by their race and their, their history, their sex, what they do with their genitalia. I mean, it's really kind of horrific. It's class warfare. Because in the end, I wrote about this in Ameritopia. On the one hand, they talk about us as for, as for the masses. And on the other hand, they want to separate us into uh, groups based on uh, our physical features, our economic features, or whatever it is, in order to turn us against one another. So on the one hand, we're this mass, you know, the, the workers, the whatever. And then on the other hand, it's, uh, oh, you're black, and you're white, and you're gay, and you're straight. Uh, it is whatever works. And also, when you look at their tactics, again, the ends justify the means. On the one hand, they want the iron-fisted centralized government, except, of course, when that doesn't work. But then what do they want? They want sanctuary cities. Uh, they embrace the, the whole notion of uh, nullification that was embraced by the Confederacy. And I can go on and on. And so it's kind of a, you preempted me a little bit, but I really want to focus on one core demographic and I'm looking at some of the polls and I don't believe the polls for the most part, but I'm looking at some of the trends and the one that I'm concerned about is with seniors. And this is a, a category where the president won big and some polls show him losing bigs. Others show him winning uh, less big. We don't know for sure, but this is a group of people that I think really are high uh, volume voters. They're high percentage voters. And I think what you're talking about here with the future, what we're going to leave our children and grandchildren, such an important theme. But can you expand on that and speak directly to seniors uh, about the difference between a Biden presidency and a second term of Donald Trump? Yeah, and, and this kind of surprises me uh, if, the, if the information is correct. And... Um, I talk to seniors on my show. I've talked to them at the end of the uh, Life, Liberty, and Levin, and here's what I say. And I hope they're all listening right now. You have an obligation to leave to your children and grandchildren a country that is freer and stronger and more prosperous than the one you inherited. Every generation has a responsibility to the next generation. We have a Democrat party that is a very radical party that embraces anti-Semitism, a Democrat party that seeks uh, to eviscerate our constitutional system. They're focused on the Supreme Court. They're focused on the Senate, separation of powers and those things that are so important to us. You have a Democrat party that doesn't believe in citizenship. It's talking about open borders and basically treating illegal aliens as citizens, which will absolutely bankrupt our country, not just health care, the entire country. You have a Democrat party that is teaching through the 1619 Project and other propaganda uh, that it's teaching our children to hate America. Now, as senior citizens, and look, I'm 63, so I guess I count, uh, we have benefited greatly from this country. We have invested greatly in this country with our time and our lives and some people with their blood. Why in the hell would we vote for a political party that is the most radical party absolutely since the Civil War that would turn this country inside out that would turn it from a superpower to just another third-rate, declining industrial country? Why would we do that to our children and grandchildren? So this election, senior citizens more than any other group of people, should be walking over glass to make sure that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and Nancy Pelosi, but the radicals, AOC and Presley and all the rest, are defeated and crushed. Uh, and uh, they should know better than anybody. We should know better than anybody. Uh, what a magnificent country this is. And we damn well better come out in big numbers and do the right thing.
Mark Levin is with me, host of the Mark Levin Show on this station, as well as terrestrial stations, Life, Liberty, and Levin on Fox News, and Levin TV on the Blaze TV, and you should read all of his books. I read all of them. And uh, Mark, the uh, you're, you're speaking to something that's just so, so important because I think a lot of people want to excuse not voting for Trump because they don't like some of his tweets and they don't like some of his boorishness from time to time. Uh, but how is Joe Biden the solution to that? Joe Biden, I watched Joe Biden call the president of the United States a clown twice to his face on national television uh, two weeks ago. Uh, I watched him repeatedly tell the president of the United States to shut up. This is all stuff that I'm not exactly an old guy. I'm 34 years old. Uh, it, it's the, in, uh, my father was not exactly a disciplinarian. The, the idea that that would happen, that a man would call president to his face publicly and no one would care about it, those names, uh, is appalling. And we just whistled past the graveyard on that one. You know, uh, the president's tweets, uh, this is very odd to me. Joe Biden has spent his long career in Washington, D.C., coddling up the segregationists doing the most awful things as a senator, trying to destroy the families and characters of men who've come up to serve this country, Robert Bork, Clarence Thomas, and others. Joe Biden has been accused of rape by Tara Reid. Rape is what she's accusing him of, and nobody cares. Meanwhile, anything and any that is said about the president results in some kind of a criminal investigation. Right. Joe Biden is a very nasty human being. He always has been a very nasty human being. He has lied his way into power. He's been a plagiarist. He's cheated on exams in law school. He's stolen words out of Robert Kennedy's mouth. Um, he, 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 he is a man uh, who is desperate to be president of the United States. And this is his third run. On the other hand, Donald Trump was not desperate to be president of the United States. And he comes out of the private sector. He remains an outsider. He's stirring things up. We need things to be stirred up. And why does he tweet the way he tweets? Because he's one of us. He's one of us. I tweet the way he tweets. Many times I talk the way he talks. People may not like it, but he's not one of these rehearsed, polished uh, politicians. He is a down-to-earth guy who talks the way that most Americans talk, and he tweets the way most Americans think. I'm just being honest about it. And people may not like, but so what? And let's look at his policies. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. He has been spectacularly successful, particularly given the fact that they've tried to destroy his presidency even before he became president. And he has a party, the Democrat Party, that is doing everything it can to cripple him. Uh, so when you look at what the, the stress he's been under, the attacks he's been under, the party that he has faced right now, he has been a spectacular president. And then I would say to people, most people haven't taken time to read the 110-page Communist Manifesto. I don't think Biden's read it. It doesn't much matter. They're going to implement it. Every aspect of this culture and society is going to be turned on its head. And I don't mean in a good way. It is, it is the most radical, extreme document in American history. They're going to destroy our energy sector. They're going to destroy our health care sector. They're going to destroy our schools. They're going to destroy our suburbs, and they're going to do it as fast as humanly possible. Look, I live in Virginia. The Democrats took over uh, for the first time in modern times the Assembly, the Senate, and the governorship. They have rammed through the most radical abortion laws, gun laws, taxes, and so forth, and they move. It takes two years. It takes no time at all. The country, can, the country since we're so uh, uh, detached from our Constitution, and we are, in many respects, we're a post-constitutional country, and I've talked about this before. And because of that, because so many of our uh, firewalls have already been breached, there's not left. There's not a whole lot left to breach, and so they're going to make a run, uh, you know, for the for the for the final uh, uh, jumping over these final firewalls in two years, and they're telling us that. So if this this is so important, and to worry about tweets to me is so Mickey Mouse. It's so absurd. It's exactly, uh, exactly. You know, the house is burning down, and I'm worried. Did I lock the front door? I, I don't know if I locked the front door. The house is burning down. And, and that's what I want people to hear. And it's not even it's even beyond that because it's it's also that as you said at the start, Biden's a nasty guy. Biden's a so if if you think Trump is a nasty guy, well, Biden's not the solution to that. 
So, and he's just a guy with worse policies and I think worth, worth worse uh, ethics. And look at who the president's brought in. Uh, and this is where I want to segue, Mark, and, and you've been very generous with, with your time. I really appreciate it. Um, the Supreme Court confirmation hearing seems to be coasting along for Amy Coney Barrett, who's a true class act. And then you have this contrast with the other news cycle that's going on is with Hunter Biden, who literally the photo surfaces with he's got a crack pipe hanging out of his mouth and you can't even tweet it without it getting censored. Yeah, the uh, the the left. L- l- let me say this: Corporate America has now thrown in with the left. You know, they used to play footsie. You can see the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is now thrown in with the left. They've thrown in with the left because they think the left is going to succeed in the end. Whether we win this election or the next, they figure we're well, one election away. You know, from what I call a meritopia, the left taking really strong control of the country, and corporations are that way. You know, corporations can survive under fascism. They survived during the Third Reich. They'll do whatever they have to do if they have no conscience whatsoever. And unfortunately, that's what we have in corporate America. Not every corporation, but too damn many, no conscience whatsoever. So much like the left. And so this is a this is this is a huge problem. Look at the money. We haven't talked about this, but very quick. Look at the money Joe Biden is raising. He has hundreds of millions of dollars more than the Trump campaign. And it's not because of little donors and that sort of thing. First of all, there's serious questions about where some of this money is coming from. Much of it's dark money. But also we know that Wall Street's thrown in with him, that major corporations have thrown in with him, and even putting him aside. They've thrown in with Black Lives Matter. They've thrown in the most radical elements uh, in our country. You can, you know, even, if, you know, me, you're going to laugh at this. I like watching, say, the History Channel or HGTV just to get my mind off stuff. And the commercials are all political. For the right. networks. That's right. And you go, oh, my God. And then and then our culture in, in elementary schools and so forth, uh, pushing this this ideology and this agenda. Um, so we can, you know. No, you know, no, it, it's amazing. Way. So so and my version of that is I watch the golf channel and the, the golf yeah. has been very wise that they do not make. They've sta- steered clear of the politics entirely, not taken a side one way or the other. And it's I think it's, it's like helped UFC, their- which I watch. Yeah, and so it's aside from the commercials, all the ads are all woke now. They're all woke corporatism, and all the the richest, most pampered, largely white people on the planet acting like they're down with the struggle. It's so cringe-inducing, Mark. Yeah, and by the way, I watch the UFC. It's the it's the best. I mean, I mean, every now and then you got to close your eyes to the violence, but still, still, it's uh, I go there for the non-political stuff. Well, what this tells you is, and Andrew used to talk about it. We've lost the culture. Right, and so we need to go on offense. We got to win this election. We need to win the politics, and we need to get back into the schools. We need to start defunding the colleges and universities. Uh, we we need to start engaging at that level much more. And uh, and you and I and others, I guess, will be talking about this more in the years ahead. But sure. November third is absolutely crucial. I just want your audience bring five or ten people with you. If you don't bring them with you, get them to vote early. You're the Thomas Paine. You're the Paul Revere. That's how crucial this is. I even say, and it shocks me that I say it, vote straight Republican. We got to hold the Senate. We need to get rid of Pelosi. We'll work out the details later. But this is now one ideological army against us. Us. Who are we? We are the Constitution's defenders. The Constitution's on the ballot. Look at it that way. Uh, so well stated. I, I got to get your quick take on Judge Barrett and how the confirmation hearings are going and how they differ from, for example, the Kavanaugh hearings. Any thoughts off the top of your head? Oh, she's fantastic. Uh, absolutely fantastic. The Democrats have decided they'll attack her, but they can't attack her the way they attack Kavanaugh. What they did to Kavanaugh was so disgusting. It's beyond belief. And I'm not even a big Kavanaugh guy, but uh, I think it went very, very well with her. Now, I still don't trust them. You know, they always wait to the last minute to dump sure. something. I still don't trust them, but the Republicans, uh, so far, they're holding firm. They're uh, they're actually doing pretty well. So, uh, fingers crossed. She'll, she'll be, I think, she'll be a tremendous justice. As a matter of fact, to be perfectly honest with you, when I was asked uh, whether the president should go with her or Kavanaugh, I said, absolutely her. But it was McConnell who pushed for Kavanaugh. And by the way, you know why McConnell pushed Kavanaugh? He said he'd be easier to to confirm. Unbelievable. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's amazing. I guess he was and, wrong. 
You know, and I, I always liked Kavanaugh, but I liked Barrett, too. And you guys could play back the shows. I think she was my pick then, too. I, I'm not as much of an authority as you are, Mark, but I, I'm with you on that. But it uh, looks like we're going to get three uh, if fingers crossed, as you said. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. The Mark Levin show every evening on this station, Life, Liberty and Levin on Fox News and the weekends, Levin TV on Blaze TV, at Mark Levin show on Twitter and read Alex, all his let books. Let me just say this. Yeah, let go ahead. Just say this. Of course, the floor is yours. Thank God for Breitbart. You do a tremendous show, and you guys are very, very generous with your time and your support. So I just want to thank you, and I want your audience to know that. That means the world to me, and I know it'll mean the world to my whole staff when I tell them that you said that. Thanks, Mark. All right. God bless. God bless you, and come back whenever you like. We'll be right back.